again, thank you so much for being here. And for those of you that are joining us live and or uh, watching this recording, thank you uh, for uh, giving us your time. My name is Josh Clark. I'm the head of school of Landmark School. I also serve as the chair of the International Dyslexia Association. And this is uh, kind of my uh, intellectual playground where I get to interview fascinating people about a topic that I find fascinating in and of itself. And that is this intersection of AI, uh, uh, education, and what this specifically means for dyslexia and LD learners and, and uh, all of these things. Um, and I have the great pleasure today of having Dr. Glenn Kleinman. Am I, I'm saying that right, Glenn, That's right? Correct. Yes, Thank yes. You. Dr. Glenn Kleiman joining me, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, go through a formality for a moment. Forgive me, I'm gonna talk about you, Glenn, while you're uh, uh, looking at me. But I'll uh, briefly uh, give a, a, a bio. So uh, uh, Glenn is a senior advisor at the Stanford Graduate School of Education, where his work focuses on the potential of AI to enhance teaching and learning. Previously, he was a professor of education and executive director of the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation at North Carolina State University. He also, as we were just discussing, and I'm sure we'll get into, um, uh, was started an ed tech company in the early 1980s. Am I right about that, Glenn? That's correct, yep. One of the first ed tech companies. Uh, so has been doing this for a great deal of time. He has also uh, served on the advisory committee for Teach AI, which is hopefully something I'd love to talk to you and pick your brain more about as we go uh, forward uh, uh, in this conversation. Um, but that's an, an impressive uh, a collection of uh, organizations, individuals who are looking at not only how can we teach with, with AI, but I also love, again, maybe we could talk about what to teach with uh, about AI. What, you know, what, not only how do we use it as a tool, what do we also need to explicitly think about in terms of teaching about AI itself, which I think is you know, another fascinating um, I will also, before I forget to uh, recommend, if you are not following Glenn on Medium, you need to, because, uh, uh, and Beck, you put an article out like 45 minutes ago, so I, I desperately tried to comb through it uh, uh, just before we jumped on this call, but um, I really enjoyed all your readings, uh, all, all your writing on Medium, so thank, thank you for you. That, sharing it. You are quick. I did just post that this morning. <laughs> Um, so again, so excited for you to be here um, uh, and, to, and to have this conversation. Um, and Glenn, I might have mentioned this to you, but you know, I always thought to myself, if I ever got to do something like this and interview really interesting people, um, I would always want to start with the same question, which is this idea of um, what was school like for you? So you're, you dedicated your career and your kind of you know uh, uh, purpose, I think, in many ways, to education. So I'd be fascinated to know just for you, what was what was school like? What, what, ah, what it's an interesting school? question. That was one I wasn't expecting, but uh, <laughs> try to be brief. So I'm a product of the New York City public schools. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I went to public schools neighborhood public schools I could walk to from kindergarten through the end of high school. Um, and, you know, I think Brooklyn was a great place to grow up. I was of a generation, I started, I was born in 52, so you can see how far back this is, but, you know, there was the baby boom. There were kids all over and games and play and schools were crowded, but the schools were, were pretty good then, and the teachers were often very good. Not all, but many were. Um, but I had a different family background, which I think is probably the most relevant to my career and fed into that. So I have a sister who's four years older and he's very, not, not a well-educated family, but an educationally oriented family. And my sister liked to play school. So she would come home from school and teach me stuff. So I kind of knew how to read and write a little bit um, before I started. My father had wanted to be a math teacher, but that was disrupted by serving in World War II when he came back and opened some stores and never got back to it, but he always enjoyed mathematics and we would play mathematics games. My mother was an artist who, when I was in middle school, went back to school and got finished her degree. Her education had been disrupted by the war also. She was a Rosie the Riveter and went into the factories, but went back and became an art teacher. Um, and then became the art director at a big Jewish community center in Brooklyn for 42 years. So I had this art education side. And most importantly, my beloved grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, who had come from Ravaruska, Ukraine, where she grew up, and fortunately came here as a young woman because none of her family survived the Holocaust. She was so passionate about education. I remember her telling me that when she grew up, they did not teach girls to read. But she was so upset about that, that her father secretly taught her to read. Um, 
that she came here, she went to night school, she learned English, she could read and write English. And I know when I would go visit her often, other Jewish people from the neighborhood would come to her for help translating letters or writing letters. And there's nothing she took more pride in that her daughter became a teacher and then towards the very end of her life that her grandson was going to be a professor. So very heavy emphasis. But in school itself, I did fine, but I was not a scholar. I was a jock. Sports mm. is what mattered. Um, I did well in math and I did okay in other things. Um, but what I remember is mostly being bored, unfortunately, and just kind of sitting there and waiting it out. I was always a very good test taker, so I would take whatever tests they were given and do well, and they would label me an underachiever. And I thought about that a lot. It was kind of, didn't anybody think that maybe I wasn't being engaged or I was bored, but it was just, I was labeled an underachiever, and that would report that would go to my parents, and they would say, you know, why don't you try harder? And I say, because I'm bored. And that was <laughs> most of education for many years, with, you know, a few exceptions of really good teachers who got me really interested in things. So not your typical school background of someone who spent their life in education, but that's really where it all came from. Oh, I, I love it. I love and I, I always love uh, uh, meeting somebody like yourself who has gone on to have some kind of, you know, academic prowess and was labeled as, you know, an underachiever. I always think that that speaks so much to our school system in general. Yeah. Um, I, I will have to say, I certainly had the opportunity. I went to James Madison High School in Brooklyn, which was my local neighborhood school three blocks away. Um, my only contribution was playing on the baseball team, but that's the New York City Public School where Chuck Schumer, who was a year ahead of me and I knew, our Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Bernie Sanders all graduated from. Oh, wow. And, uh, Bernie Sanders and I went to the same elementary school. So it's that neighborhood where there were some incredible, incredible people coming out through those same public schools I went to, but they took more advantage of the opportunities than I did. Wow, that's really cool. I got you. That make, you know, it's uh, uh, that's going to be a hard like alumni reunion to go back. Well, I teach at Stanford. Well, I'm Bernie Sanders. And I'm <laughs> right. <laughs> I haven't been back to any of those, but. Uh, so, no, I mean, I, I knew Chuck Schumer when we played Little League Baseball together, but he was always off in another world of thinking things that the rest of us didn't think about. Wow, that's really cool. That's really, really cool. Thank you uh, for sharing all that. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, and we'll kind of get to the world of AI in a moment, but again, I think even before people started to join us, you know, you, you got into ed tech before there was ed tech, right? What, what kind of got you, what drew you to uh, technology and education? Pretty much. Well, I'm, you know, just to finish the story quickly, I, I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo. I was a 16 year old freshman in 1968. So the college experience was a little unusual. We didn't finish school the first two years. Miraculously got into graduate school in psychology at Stanford with a lot of focus on language understanding and early reading. Um, ended up as a visiting scholar for a few years at the University of Toronto uh, with a close friend who was working with special needs students. And we observed some things about working with um, what are now called attention disability students. And these were the most severe students. They were being brought into a hospital setting for a study of new um, medications for them. And we observed that some of these kids who really you know, were not attending and were challenging, when they played an early video Pong game, they looked like normal kids. Mm. And we began to sort of dig into that and realize there was a lot of data about it. constant feedback helped with their attention. And we thought, could that be applied to education? And uh, Peter Lindsay, who was the head there and a wonderful fellow, one of the, the originators of a whole lot of work in cognitive psychology, we talked with him about it. And he came up one day carrying this Commodore PET computer saying, you think we could use this to do one of those studies you talked about, about attention? And I went home and learned how to program it and wrote some software for a research study that turned out pretty well because the computer, of course, could continuously provide immediate feedback and the kids did much better under those conditions. And we wrote about that and people began wanting to buy the software and I kind of wanted to go back to California. So picked up and moved back to California and that's when I started a company. Um, and it was just, you know, I've, I've led this really just lucky life where one thing leads to another and it all worked out somehow, even though I wasn't, you know, following the traditional path. So I stepped out of the academic world for quite a while. And again, thank you for sharing that. And I love to hear that 
that kind of almost anecdote or that inspiration that it was putting kind of, uh, you know, these kids on the spectrum of attention difficulties in front of a, a game, a computer game that gave this sense of norm normalcy. And, and I, the, um, the constant feedback thing is fascinating, right? That's really interesting because I obviously that has very much proved to be uh, for good and for bad, uh, you know, depending on who you talk to, I think uh, a truth. So fascinating, fascinating. And I, I also love and so many people that um, will uh, hopefully uh, watch this interview at some point are folks that are in the LD space. And there's always this tension, I think unnecessarily, between technology and remediation, as if they're in competition with uh, each other, right? To, uh, uh, so again, I, I love hearing that you being in the position that you are and the influence that you have, this really all began at looking at LD and technology versus a competition between the two. Oh, yeah, I don't see them as competitive. I think, you know, mantra is always education leads, technology follows and serves. So I think we have to focus on the education problems. But I guess I'm a very practical person. So, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't made to be a scholar and just publish journal articles. And we did another little thing in another school, working at kids who were really cognitively deficient and a simple little program. And we wanted to print out the results for them to have something. And what are those called? I forget the name, but the, the, the cheapest printer I could buy printed on this kind of aluminum foil paper. Oh, wow. And we didn't need much of it. So I bought it. It had this roll of paper and the kids would get a little printout. And turn, yeah, classroom was hidden down in the basement of the school. People didn't even know they were there. And suddenly these kids had this space age looking paper that attracted attention. And people began to visit that classroom and other kids were wondering what was going on in a way they had been so neglected and just got me thinking more and more about you know school cultures and the impact of technology and what it can mean in different ways so that was another piece that set me on this path i've been on since that's really I, again i love that idea of uh, uh, equaling you know uh, equaling the playing field uh, and, and the culture piece i think that's also so important too right it's not only about the instruction it's also the culture that you know uh, these poor kids being in the basement and ignored um fascinating yeah, um, and I, I also found then and continue to find that it's the LD specialists who are among the most thoughtful people about good education, personalized education, universal design for learning, I and mean, just incredible people working in those areas. Well, I, I would certainly echo that. People I work with and the colleagues, it's amazing. And, and I think you're right, especially, I think it's uh, fascinating that we're now, uh, as we uh, look at AI and there's all this conversation around we could personalize education. Imagine, you know, what that's going to allow us to do, which is what LD has been about since the get-go, yeah. um, is figuring out where you are and then and moving forward. Um, I, I, shifting us a little bit more towards AI, for the purposes of this conversation, could you define, and I, I know you have actually in some of your writing, but for purposes of our conversation, how do you define AI or artificial intelligence, right? Um, well, I'll just take the simplest classical one. It's uh having machines do things that we used to think could only be done by people because they require this thing called intelligence, which has to do with knowledge and reasoning and thinking and problem solving. So I think the definition changes over time. I mean, you know, the uh, devices we have in our cars and on our phones that enable us to navigate from place to place have an incredible amount of intelligence, right? They know every street and every landmark. They can figure out these directions instantly and they can track us as we go. But we don't even think about those anymore. But those are highly intelligent devices. So I think as things become common, we stop thinking about them as AI. But there's a tremendous amount of AI all around us, and we all use it every day. And to your point, we have for a really long time. I think I was read something uh, that you wrote about ways. And so I'm, I'm addicted to ways, the GPS. And when you live in Atlanta, you have to have ways to even mm -hmm. you know, every day to get home. And I, am I right that you even said something about that? That AI really is based on like the 19. 1950s technology and that it's just a very oh. clear set of rules. Yeah, it's the uh, the salesman problem. How do you, if you have to make the following 12 stops, how do you optimize the route? So it's a classic optimization problem. I don't, I think you're thinking of somebody else. I, I think I drafted something on that, but never published it actually. But you're exactly right. That those, you know, some old algorithms, but even, you know, the recommendations you get from Netflix or Amazon for books or for whatever music, system, those are all AI. Those are analyzing a tremendous amount of data, looking at what movies you've watched and said you liked and finding people who've liked those movies and what else they watched and give you recommendations all happening instantly. But the scale of data is something, you know, that AI uh, is needed to process. 
And and kind of think about that trajectory. And again, I, I reference you, you published something on Medium uh, uh, today, and that mm -hmm. what eight things that we need to know uh, as as educators around AI. And do do you feel like? Because I also want to get into um, uh, the writing framework and your your space acronym mm -hmm. and what all these mm -hmm. means. Yeah. Um, but in, in just again reading what you've written. I think, tell me if I'm wrong, is this the first uh, kind of public uh, uh, report that you've made kind of post chat GPT-4 and or do you, do you see an acceleration, right? Like, is, is it even from six months ago to now, do you see a distinction in what we need to think about or do? Yeah, and um, we've done a little looking at, you know, how chat GPT-4 is different from 3.5 and how it's different from Bing and Bond and all this stuff. It is moving so quickly. It, it drives me crazy, frankly. I can't keep up with it, but no one can. Um, it's changing rapidly. Um, and I think that's very difficult for educators. Um, in fact, we had a meeting at Stanford around AI and education back in February. And we had a, a representative, a wonderful woman from OpenAI, who is there linked to educators. And at table discussion, she said, well, you know, OpenAI really wants to know what educators need from us. And my first thought that I said, well, next time you change our world, because they just dropped ChatGPT out in November, right, without any warning. Next time you change our world, give us a little warning so we can do some planning around it. Because, you know, schools, and I, this is in the, the paper I just published today, you know, education change is so complex. There are so many stakeholders to change things, you got to change goals and standards and curriculum materials, and you have to prepare the teachers and you change the assessments, and often there are policies involved. We can't throw a switch just because a new AI tool has suddenly become freely available and easy to use to, what, 100 million people in two months. Right. Um, so I think we really have a, a time frame difficulty that educators are going to need to continue grappling with, and it's not going to stop. Um, that you know, right now we're seeing <clears throat> next steps in AI, where as you know, many people have probably already read, you know, now the um, large language models like ChatGPT and Bing, well, Bing has ChatGPT under it or GPT under it, <clears throat> are being integrated with web search so they can have more up-to-date information. They're being integrated with more powerful tools um, to do mathematics and other things. And there it's all being linked together. So you know, we'll no longer have a, a language model and a speech model and a graphic model. Um, it'll all be integrated. And you can say to your AI, you know, make me a picture of this and write a story about it. In fact, write me a storybook with pictures and it'll be able to do that. And that's just going to keep going. Um, I don't see any end in sight of the developments. There are so many brilliant people in so many places working away on this. And of course, you know, there's a good number of them at Stanford and they're doing amazing things. But they're not educators, they're technologists pushing the technology. And as educators, we really need to, to grab hold of this and control what it means in our schools. And I, I completely agree. And I so appreciate the, uh, the the fact that you, you know, specialize this and you're overwhelmed by the rate of um, mm -hmm. change and adoption makes me feel a little bit better. Um, oh, everyone is. I don't know anybody who says, hey, I'm, I'm keeping up with it all. I'm really yeah. on top of everything going on. It's totally impossible. It's it's it is it's mind blowing and I I I said this before I, I I worry about it a little bit in that this is coming as huge opportunity and I think that's all wonderful mm -hmm. but it's also coming on the backs of just extreme teacher burnout from COVID and I I, mm -hmm. I think we can gain so many efficiencies from this in the long term but that transition period is is going to be tough. Well, and that always is has been my biggest worry about technology all along is that we expect teachers to magically figure out what to do with it. And I was just looking at some guidelines, one well done were from Duke University. I looked at Stanford guidelines and that's the, the university level, but they basically put all the responsibility on the teacher to figure out, well, how can your students use it? How can you enforce this? And this is totally new. This opens new ways of teaching and learning. And unless we find real time and support for the teachers to learn about it, to experience as learners, to work with colleagues, to have mentoring, and to have support from the administrators in that community uh, to try some new things. And some of those won't work. And teachers often feel like, well, I can't take any risk. If it's not gonna work perfectly, I can't try it. We don't live in a world where that's workable. I mean, the, the technology folks put things out and call them minimally viable products. 
and get feedback from their users where teachers feel like, no, I, I can't try something new and different because somebody may go home and say to their parent, we did this dumb thing and they'll call my principal and you know, you just get in this mess. So we really have, I think, deep issues about that. But unless we stop attending so much to the technology and attend to what teachers need to be able to use it well, uh, we're not gonna make any progress here. So I, I really like what you just said there. So you, can we dive into that a little bit deeper? You're, am I right? You're advocating technology is great. Oh, it's important, but it's before we worry about the integration of it or kind of even the outcomes, how, how step one is pairing it with educators in a way that's accessible to them that they, you know, they, the, the like risk encouraged, if you will, or, you know, a, yeah. a sense of safety, but also just time. Is that fair? Absolutely. Time. And, you know, over the years I've been involved in many places, teacher contracts used to have professional development days. Those have been reduced. Funding for professional development has been reduced. In every other field, as these new technologies come in, you know, the corporations make serious efforts to prepare their employees for it and to train them and support them. We don't do that well in education. And so we add another burden to teachers. And, you know, some teachers are into this and they work 24 seven and they, find cool things to do and they're wonderful people but if this is going to go to scale we need a system of online professional learning not not of ongoing professional learning some can be online doesn't all need to be certainly um and really grapple with the changes that this can bring but to me um in all the education reforms i've seen which have been many i think we always have to remember that we all tend to teach the way we've been taught and I think given teachers some experiences using AI for their own work, for their own learning, is the important first step. And we often skip that when you say, you know, take, bring ChatGP in your classroom or ban your kids from using it or do something with, without what they really need to do it successfully. And I hate to te see teachers set up for failure because they've been given an impossible task without the supports they need to do it well. And I completely agree. And because I know anyone that's watching this that's associated with the school right now, we're all, if we're not, we should be thinking about what in the hell are we going to do in August with all these, you know, with teachers. Absolutely. But one of your first steps, which I appreciate, is, is maybe not so much think about mm -hmm. design a lesson around Gate, Great Gatsby using Chat GPT, but instead maybe encourage how you as a human being can use this in a way. Yeah. Your own life. It could be a professional setting or it doesn't have to be a professional setting. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, to learn some about it. Although I think, you know, for a teacher, trying it out of helping to craft a lesson is actually a good example. And looking at this, some good work out there, I'll probably mention laid by Ethan Mollick about how you prompt um, these tools to be effective, but they can be really good assistance as to teachers and things like planning a lesson. And I've got some stuff in progress that hopefully I'll get out sometime soon about that. Um, but I think that's a great kind of exploration and preferably, you know, teachers working with some of their colleagues on that and exploring it together and sharing ideas to give them some feel of it. And even if they never use the lesson, they'll learn a lot about AI. But I think um, there's supporting teachers, there's multi levels here. So there's teachers want to try some things out, um, how to support them from doing some initial trials and learning from it. Um, kids are using it how to have kids use it constructively. And certainly there's the big worry about kids will take their assignment, turn it into a prompt to chat GPT or one of the others and turn in the output as their work. Um, that is certainly a worry, but there are ways if you craft the assignments so they need to be more personalized or recent or in the local context, or if you have discussions, and uh, you know, I think there are things like uh, students should be required to document how they use AI. Um, I can go on and on this, you know, banning it is not the solution. We, we've seen that very quickly, but I think structuring how it can be used well, and I've worked with some wonderful educators and particularly at the Stanford Online High School that are using it in ways that really deepen kids' understanding of literature in this case, but about their own writing while they learn about AI. So these aren't all separable. Get in there and trying some things is good. Um, but there's a lot to learn. I mean, the, the paper you referenced that I published this morning um, starts out saying the new gener generative AI is fundamentally different from prior technologies. And I think that's very important to understand because these tools do things that no prior technology can do. Um, 
But one of, one of the eight points is also that generative AI is very different from human intelligence. And for people to understand what these tools do, what they don't do, what the limitations are, what the risks are, which is another one of my eight, um, I think are very, very important. And I think there's a framing that you'll see in work from the U.S. Department of Ed, from Digital Promise, and, and other ways, including Chris Didi, who you recently interviewed, talking about we need to think about these tools as augmenting our intelligence, not replacing it. Um, I love the example. I think Chris Didi is where I first got it from. If you go back to, to Star Trek and uh, Captain Picard and Data, or in the earlier versions that I knew better, uh, Captain Kirk and Spock, we have you know, the human intelligence, insight, passion, ethics, and all of that in the human character. And you have the analytic, logical ability in the non-human or half-human character and how they augment each other. And I think that kind of way of thinking about it is very valuable. And we need to help teachers understand that this cannot replace them, but hopefully it can help them and save them time on tasks that are not all that much fun for them and give them more time to work directly with their students and do the things that only teachers can do. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think in today's, what you published today, you made some reference that, yes, this, this actually allows you to be a teacher again or could allow you to, you know, to th those things that do make you, that are so unique and that are the skill sets of a teacher, which I think is such an encouraging uh, uh, Absolutely. Point. And I think Malik has written about that too, as, as AI is a teacher's assistant. Mm -hmm. This is your assistant and you have to train it and instruct it to be productive for you like you would any other assistant. But that's, I think, a good framing for teachers rather than what is this thing? Is it taking over? <laughs> and what, what's my role? It's your assistant and learning how to use it as an effective assistant is, I think, the way to go. Well, and something else you referenced that has kind of been my, um, I have no solution for yet, but one of the things that I've come to think about over the course of this summer is, to your point, it, it can make, it's a partner that we can have, it can augment our intelligence, but to your point, it's it's actually not, an, it's not, it's not human intelligence, and it's not like, it's not an iterative, I, I, don't, I, said, I don't feel like this is an iterative technology, this is something very different. And so what do we need to explicitly tell our teachers and our students? Because I'm, I'm constantly surprised by people's blind faith in it. I'm yes, yeah. And uh, actually, I'm working with two of my colleagues from the Stanford Online High School who are wonderful teachers about that, where they did some interesting activities and had the kids compare things they wrote to what ChatGPT wrote. And this was around things like James Baldwin's writing or Virginia Woolf's writing. So they were studying literature at all. And I sat in a discussion with the students and it was incredible. They began kind of thinking of the AI as if it was a human and critiquing what it wrote. And they realized that it really was, you know, passionless and it didn't really, it, it felt very vanilla. It felt like a committee had written it, that it didn't have a strong voice like the real authors do. Um, and they called it a Pollyanna at one point because, you know, now with the filters, it kind of waters everything down. It doesn't want to get involved in controversy. So, you know, James Baldwin has this passionate writing about racism in France and the United States. And uh, ChatGPT writes an essay about that. But, ends with, but even though there were some challenges, you know, it turns out it was a good experience to have. Right. <laughs> and it's like, no, that is not what James Baldwin. Right. And one of the teachers pointed out on, on some of the tools now that say you can have a, a conversation with a simulated author. And so she tried it out with Shakespeare. And Shakespeare responded with a bunch of bullet points. <laughs> like, no, Shakespeare does not write bullet points. But really, memo. Like, if people think they really are getting insights into an author from these tools where it is not that, it is so watered down, the tools are not just using what the author wrote, they're using everything that's been written about the author and everything else. And it can really be um, misinforming and misleading. And <clears throat> I think the best quote at the end of this discussion, one of the the students, and these were high school students, said, we had this insight, said, well, we have to remember, it doesn't really write, it just calculates, which is really, really true. It is calculating what the likely next word might be yeah. and using probabilities to choose one of those. And I think that is such an insightful quote. And it's those kinds of things people have to learn, not just, not from hearing us talk about it, but they have to experience it and really look at well, what's the quality of this writing? Um, 
So I feel like I can go on and on, but I'll say one more thing here and then I'll, I'll ask you something that it also gets back into that issue of trying to detect whether students used AI. Um, I think that is a hopeless endeavor. I don't think you will have software detection that will be reliable. There's a recent study from Stanford showing it's particularly biased against students who are English language learners because the tools look at sentence complexity and vocabulary variety and someone who's learning English while writing will, will be more like an AI system. And I think those tools can be used to say to students as feedback, you know, your writing isn't really more engaging or interesting or doesn't have a personal voice. It could almost be written by AI. So you should do better. But the reliability of those tools is so far away. Nobody should ever think of using them as, you know, accusing students of plagiarism or misusing them. I think we need to be very careful there. Well, I think that's such an important point to make because I think that is every teacher's gut response is I'll just use this thing. And, I'll, you know, I Thank nothing's you. really changing. I'm still in complete control. It's all totally fine. But yeah, that I, everything I've read is exactly what you just said, that no, it's, it's a yeah. losing game. No, those won't work. I mean, the only solution is to sit down with the students and talk about it and ask them to document how they used AI if you feel like they just plug something in and hand it in the output. You know, you've got to reveal that through showing that they don't really know what they've handed in. Uh, you cannot rely on these detection tools to do that. Well, and that kind of gets to, again, one of your pieces around this idea of, of your acronym around space, mm -hmm. um, which I found to be, uh, again, I would highly recommend everybody, uh, and we'll post it when we uh, uh, publish this, a link to it, because it's a very kind of toolsy approach about AI and writing. And there's a couple things that you said, um, uh, you kind of pose this question around, you know, what what are the basic writing skills that we need to have kids master that we can, and before we introduce AI, right? And the acknowledgement mm -hmm. that it, there, there are some things that we need to be able to just do, but mm -hmm. imagine what, it, with that, what you can then accomplish with this AI system. Am I, am I capturing that correctly? Yeah, in, in some ways we're, you know, it, there are differences, but we're replaying what we went through in education with, uh, calculators with uh, data tools that change the way we can teach statistics. Um, we're sort of in, in that stage. And I think there's a fundamental question of to what extent are we focused on teaching students to write as we've all learned to write without these tools? And to what extent are we interested in teaching students to be strong writers with the appropriate use of these amazing tools? And there's a lot of complex issues underlying that distinction. And I certainly believe, you know, students should know how to write and they should be able to compose sentences and paragraphs on their own. Um, but in the space framework, and this was early on, I mean, every, everything is outdated in months, right? <laughs> it's almost like, you know, but I, I wrote this a while ago and it's just sort of a, a discussion point, <clears throat> but uh, space starts out with setting directions. So as the writer, you know, the AI doesn't know what you need to write or want to write, <clears throat> and you need to really define the directions and you need to prompt the AI, which you can fortunately do in natural language now, but carefully crafting prompts and, you know, telling AI is its role as an editor, is it a co-author, you actually can talk to it like that, you are my editor on this, and I drafted this paragraph and now I'm stuck, you know, can you make, give me five suggestions for what might come next. And I find it's best to use it not to say, tell me what comes next, but give me some suggestions. Um, so there's learning how to prompt the system is the P. So set directions, prompt. Um, A is then assessing what the AI produces because it will produce crazy stuff and misleading stuff and really interesting new stuff. And that's in part why I say, have it produce a bunch of options that you can filter and, and go through and then curating it in, in much of writing, you know, the writer's writing something, AI may be contributing, the writer has to put that all together, deciding what to use, what to not use. Um, and then there's a final kind of editing it into one coherent document. And I think the real point there is learning to use the tool well, um, what you can get from it, what you can't, but also really focusing on assessing the writing and curating the writing, kind of different, but 
you know, you can't do that unless you've read good writing and you've learned what good writing is. So it gives a, a different twist to it, but really it's the same skills uh, that we've always tried to teach students. And I don't, I'm not pushing that framework heavily. I'm sure there's lots of other ways, but it was just to say, you know, learn how to use the tool well, be very careful in evaluating it, realize that you're in charge and you curate and edit the materials as a sort of starting point. And that was written, I don't know, that may have been written almost a year ago now. So it's ancient in AI time. No, it's, yeah, it's so funny that a year, yeah, it does, how much can change? Uh, but I, but I, what I do appreciate about it so much is your point that it's not, I think we see this and we think it's the end of writing as, as a, you know, as we know it, it's the end of writing instruction, all these things. But as you just laid it out, it is actually very similar to the traditional writing process. There are yeah. things that we might be able to do a little bit faster, a little bit better. And I, I would argue yeah. better and more instant feedback, uh, which I can only see as an asset. But it, it, it still requires a great deal of cognitive, you know, uh, acrobatics. Yeah. And I, I think it can be helpful. You know, if you the, there's always the problem of students getting started is always a big issue in writing. And we all face that as writers, you know, who get stuck. And you know, having AI, you know, given its directions and where you're going and what you need and saying, well, can you give me a starting outline, right? That Maybe that gets you rolling or, you know, sometimes you like things where you wrote the beginning of a story and, you know, the ending and you're struggling with the middle and you can say to AI, you know, I'm writing this, this play and your role is to play this character, all right? And then have a dialogue with that character and see if that will help you develop it. Um, you can ask AI, and I like this one, um, as students write, ask the AI to write a summary and see if it captured well what you're trying to say. And if it didn't, perhaps that's because some of the things you said, you didn't say clearly enough or highlight enough. So it's providing feedback in that way. We're looking a lot at writing feedback and a student I'm working with is developing an interesting tool, but I don't think we've yet figured out how to set up a tool that necessarily provides the right kind of feedback at the right time in the right way with AI. It certainly gives you feedback, but frankly, often the feedback is overwhelming or mm -hmm. highly repetitious. Uh, I wrote an op-ed and I was curious what it would say and kept saying, well, you, you should put in more examples in paragraph one and paragraph two, you should put in more examples in paragraph three. Well, the op-ed was limited to 800 words. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> Even what I said, it's limited to 800 words. Well, make your example succinct. <laughs> yeah. you, know, like, you know, I don't want to talk to you anymore. You're right. not giving me anything useful, but you, you can't assume it's got to give you this brilliant, useful feedback. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so even just the examples you gave, I love this example of I'm writing a story. Here's the background on the character. Let's have a conversation. I'd never thought about that. And again, to your point, like that, that requires some work. This is not I'm this doing. thing is going to just do this. Yeah. I, I think that's the other kind of uh, it's, it is a tool. It is not a solution. And I think we, we are sometimes over index what it can do, yeah. because, you know, we're yeah, still well, in charge for now. In that example, they also like, and you know, the character may then, the character isn't coming across how I wanted it to. And I didn't know that, you know, you don't know things until you see them written, right? right? I write so I can learn. And so then you think, well, I need to give the AI more of a description of this character. Right, yeah. You know, of what it should be. And then maybe it will produce something closer. And you get into this interesting dialogue as if it was almost the co-author in charge of this one character. Yeah. And I think that can trigger lots of interesting thinking for a student. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And I and can offer a level of differentiation that right now is frankly impossible for, you know, if I have a class of 30 kids, yes. there's no way, especially um, writing. I got out of, I got into administration to get out of grading papers because it was just soul sucking. Yes. Uh, uh, so I, to be able to do that, I think, uh, and, and on a remedial level too, you know, this is not a sentence, you know, yes. or, you know, I don't see a main idea here, all those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, there's an interesting example that, that a student working with me raised, you know, we've long encouraged students to use the dictionary and the thesaurus to help them find the right word. It's perfectly legitimate. I got this word, it doesn't seem right. I'll go look it up. I'll look at the thesaurus. Well, now uh, these tools can take a sentence and give you five or 10 or 20 alternatives to that sentence. It's like a sentence thesaurus. Is that allowed? Is that a good learning tool or is that cheating if you do that? Those are the kind of things we need to figure out. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And it, what's 
What's going to be so interesting is as we as educators adopt this and use this in our own daily lives and use it in our professional you know, spaces, what, what's okay for us and yet what we still is say <laughs> will define as cheating for a student. I, you know, I think it'll be fascinating. Oh, it, it will be. And I think <clears throat> as a work with folks on what what guidelines might schools put into place and of course there's tremendous time pressure point out well you need guidelines for your teachers too so can a teacher use ai to help prepare a lesson it's probably fine <clears throat> can they use ai to provide feedback to students so as you said you know students can get more feedback more quickly we've heard from students in writing courses they, they don't get feedback in a timely way on their drafts we need to make sure the feedback is good can a teacher use ai to grade students well, probably not, right? Right. Um, and so I think even at that level, uh, and then we also have the the consistency since schools are leaving so much to individual teachers. I've heard from some of issues where students did something that was allowed in one class and then discovered it's not allowed in another. So we really need to to get our act together on the information to teachers and students about what's acceptable in what cases and, and what's not. And I think you're sure. I think that's going to be the challenge is that in the first period, I can use AI and second period, it's, you know, completely banished. And what, yeah, I, I think that's going to be a, yeah. a difficult balance as we move forward, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And I, and I also hope and think to your point about, can we grade students using AI? I, you know, it, it also makes me think, what exactly are we grading that like I would argue in this brave new world, we shouldn't even be using assessments that are easily graded by AI. I mean, that those are irrelevant at this point uh, yeah. because they're not actually showing true student growth or, or, or unique and novel production. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I know there's, you know, ETS has hired a lot of AI people that's certainly working on that and looking at, you know, expanding what we can ask students to do because we may be able to grade them automatically or it's just not possible to do that. But that's very much, you know, summative evaluation kinds of things. I'm much more interested in, you know, assessment for learning and embedded in learning. And there, I think, to be able to provide, you know, immediate rapid feedbacks that help students learn and help inform teachers' instructional decisions is an area that's very help hopeful here. But we have a long way to go to really know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and again, full circle to your earlier point, I feel like the technology will advance so much faster than we can think of how to use it or incorporate it into what we do. And yes. <clears throat> yeah, it's gonna be interesting. So you've you've referenced Ethan Mullock a few times. I'm also I'm obsessed with Ethan Mullock. Uh, if he's a <clears throat> UPenn uh, Wharton professor looking yes. a lot at AI. And I also think <clears throat> um kind of back to your original uh, uh comment about where you got started in ed tech and in this space and LD and games. I believe Ethan Mullick looks a lot at gaming and gamification as a way of educating and uh, whatnot. And when I interviewed uh, your friend and colleague, Dr. Chris Didi, he mentioned kind of simulation learning, you know, this AI being able yeah. to, have you, and it made me think of your, your Pong example, right, of, uh, and, and being motivated and being engaged. Mm -hmm. Do you also yeah. see that as a, a space and opportunity, uh, this idea of, Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've we've had simulations. Here I'll play Historian again. You know, Oregon Trail was probably the first one that was widely used. Yes. Uh, it was a simple simulation and, and very useful. And now, you know, within a simulation, we can have AI driven characters that are much more interactive and you can really talk to and um and AI driven environments. And then we've got also the advent in you know experimental places but coming with augmented learning and virtual learning environments so which you know people from the game world are very familiar with but those technologies are moving extremely quickly also and we'll see more and more of them in the stanford group in the stanford accelerator for learning one of the initiatives were virtual field trips and developing tools so teachers and students can set up their own virtual field trips go out and film you know, something in that community and set up a sort of interactive environment very quickly that others can go into and explore. And they also can be collaborative environments. So you have, can have multiple avatars in the environment at the same time. So students are interacting with each other within the environment. And I think that's, you know, that's the world our students live in. It's game-like and it's interactive and it's visual and it 
but we also can build some really good learning into those environments. So yes, th there's lots coming now. Yeah, and, and it makes me think to your earlier comment too about we want to teach the way that we were taught and yes. this, that tension of, well, they can't have fun while they do this. That's not the whole purpose. Look, fun yeah. and learn, you're not going to get it. That's a that's a hard thing to sell students. It was always hard. I started out saying what I remember from school was being bored. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's always been hard to sell students. And given the media that they're used to and how quickly everything goes and that they all have the world at their fingertips and their cell phones, um, yeah, we've got to get away from this idea that school means sitting at a desk, listening to things or sitting, reading a book. I mean, reading is great, but we've got to make things more interactive collaborative engaging yep and and again what concerns me is the speed at which the rate at which education can become more and more irrelevant as kids have access to all these things and we just slowly laboriously begin to adopt them versus a faster integration yeah i agree i wish i had a yeah you know, more positive solutions there. But uh, I will say it's not just education. I mean, look what our policymakers are dealing with and thinking about legislation for AI. And finally, there was you know, an informal agreement between the president and some of the AI uh, companies. But there's so much that needs to be done around legislation, policy, uh, law, you know, the, the violation of copyright, the using everybody's information to create these AI systems. Uh, and uh, we're, we're not able to move in those areas either. So it's not just education. It's a lot of parts of our society cannot keep up with the technologies that are coming out so quickly. Right. Um, and we'll only, we'll only mm. get worse as we move forward, uh, which is mind boggling. Um, real quick, we had a question, um, and uh, I don't know if you have any specifics on this, but somebody put in there that uh, ChatGPT right now has a restriction that uh, you must be 13 or older uh, and that uh, 13 to 18 year olds um, need a parent permission to use chat uh, GPT. Do you know of any uh, solutions out there that are more geared towards school age kids specifically? Um, none that are currently available, although I can say that I've done a scan to check. A company called Merlin Mind is developing their own language model specifically for education. I don't know when they'll be available to schools, but that one group I would look to because they're actually addressing that issue. And I think in general, we're going to see more smaller scale large language models. ChatGPT is a large, very, very, very large language model that are developed for more specific purposes. And hopefully some of those uh, will be for students. The issue though, of course, with the FERPA regulations and everything, um, you know, they're very different regulations of uh, children under the age of 13 doing any of these online things. They've never been enforced or taken seriously, but I'm not sure if student, children under 13 are actually allowed to use Facebook or Twitter. Right, but or yeah. Any of the others. Um, so I think, you know, that putting in what the lawyers say you have to put in, but there isn't really a mechanism for stopping students from saying, nope, I'm 18 right. and I'm signing up for this. Um, and I think that's one of the big legislative issues we have that we are not protecting children properly. Right. Well, so and what, I, I actually, uh, like I say, we, in some interactions with OpenAI, they shared some materials about use in schools and they just sort of dropped into it. At the time it said um, under 18 could not use it. And we asked, well, why are you talking to schools? And then they said, oh no, that's really 13. So you're talking to schools, but only students over 13. So even within open AI, it's not something they've thought deeply about. Well, and I'm gonna be interested when, uh, and I imagine any day now, when this is integrated in Google Docs, you know, and- Any uh, day, it's, it's in beta testing and um, what's called Microsoft Copilot will integrate it into Word. And that's part of why, you know, one of my, my eight points in my what educators need to know is educators need to embrace AI to prepare students for the future, but there's no stopping it. I mean, all these tools, it's going to be embedded in it, and you'll be able to say to your word processor, well, just, I got tired, write the next couple of paragraphs for me, and it will give you something. Whether it's good or not is another question, right. but that's going to be in Google Docs and in Word. So how it's are already you- It's already infiltrating all of our schools. I mean, so I, yeah. I'm sure they'll just update their user agreement that none of us read and yes. uh, it, it'll just be there. Um, so on, 
on that point too, and we're actually getting close to an hour. Glenn, see you. Oh, that was quick. Yeah. Uh, uh, but what, as we approach that, what, what from your vantage point, you know, what is it that, uh, what do you see coming, right? Uh, you know, uh, what school five to 10 years from now or ed tech, what, what would you say, figure out now, but also be ready for X? Um, I feel political, but I'm going to avoid that question, but I'll give you a historical perspective. So as you mentioned, I started this way back in the early 80s. I actually wrote a book called Brave New Schools, How Computers Can Change Education. That was published in 1984 of all years. Wow. Um, and as I look back, I've said this many times that I actually think I had some interesting insights into the potential of technology to make education more equitable, interesting, engaging, uh, address problems of learning disabilities and equity. Um, I could never have imagined the advances we've seen in the technology. There were some people who did, but I was far from one of them. And to think, you know, it was exciting when the Apple II got aboard, you could put, make it go from 48K to 64K. And the, the first 300 board modem, and you could connect up to other computers in other places through your phone. At the, you know, to see where this has gone so quickly, what seems to me quickly is amazing. But the biggest thing is I was a million percent naive about the complexity of change in the education system. And I think that's what I've been learning these many, many decades. And as I said, you know, there are all the stakeholders, there are all the components of education, um, there are the political wins, there are the policies, uh, there are the resources. There are so many things that I think we need to take a deep breath. We need to start convening our communities. Uh, everybody has hopes for AI and everybody has fears of AI. Um, and each of us have those. And depending on the moment, we may be focused on one rather than the other. But I think we need to start the discussions with the teachers, the students, the school administrators, the parents, the community members, the policymakers. And I don't want to sit here and say, this is where I think we'll be in, in years, but I think hopefully we really need to focus on people beginning to grapple with the scale of these changes and what it means for what students need to learn, how teaching and learning can take place, and what it really means to prepare students for their futures. And you probably didn't get to the end of the article that I posted this morning, but at the very end, the final statement is a quote from John Dewey, which I'm sure you've seen elsewhere, that if we teach today's students as we taught yesterday's, we rob them of tomorrow. Mm. Oh, I like that. Yeah. John Dewey said that during the transition when we were moving to comprehensive high schools and the transition and really major reforms to prepare students for the industrial age and the transition from an agricultural to an urban world. We're at a similar historical cusp, I think, and there aren't simple answers, but I think we really need to be grappling with the world our students live in now and certainly the world they will live in is very, very different. And we need to figure out how to prepare them for that world, not to just enforce current requirements and expectations and processes. Mm. Um, I love that. I, 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 and, and I like how you phrase it as not to just enforce kind of that's that. Yep. I, I don't. I don't know if I. I don't think I would have grabbed that word, but I. Will, I think that is the word, right? Because it's not. It that's a protect protectionist word. It's a reactionary word. It's you yeah. know control, and that's what we're we need to not do. Yeah. Well, it's for the folks who say, well, because of Chat GPT, we need to go to having students write handwrite with a pen in uh, that blue books in practice situations to test their writing. Right. That's enforcing the old way of doing it. Yes, and the number of people that that has been their response when we begin these conversations is frightening to me, but yes. Although I see a lot of those people very quickly gain insights in past. It's an initial response, which yeah. I think, you know, as initial response, like banning it was an initial response. People are moving past that very, very quickly. Yes, yeah, because you have to. You have no choice. Yep, uh -huh. you have no choice, exactly. Uh, all right, so as we come up to the to the hour mark, I'd love to ask... Um, uh, uh, do you leaving our audience, do you have three things that you would recommend people either watch, listen, read, uh, 
Yeah, three things. Yeah, you... many more than three. I, I do have to mention one thing we did not get to talk about, which is fine, we covered a lot, is we really didn't talk about the impact of all this on the equity of opportunity and equity of achievement issues. And I think we need to really always say, what does this mean for making sure all kids benefit and that we don't fall into which we have before, that kids in privileged schools get to do exciting, interesting, creative, constructive things with AI, and other kids get to have AI controlling that test preparation, for example. Yeah. So we really need to keep the equity issues light. So having said that, um, I just get three. Well, one, we've already mentioned Ethan Mollick. He writes a blog called One Useful Thing. Very insightful. And he goes between the big issues to really practical guidance on how to prompt AI to be your assistant. And I just, you know, he's someone I would recommend to educators be reading in the One Useful Thing blog. Um, I may cheat and give you four. Um, in terms of trying to keep up with this, and I just this weekend read a good article in the New York Times about Wikipedia and AI and how important it's been as data to train systems, but what happens when so much of what's in Wikipedia is written by AI and how we get into this cycle. Um, but I think in general, the New York Times has been doing a, a very good job in informing people about AI and raising the issues. And I'll cheat and put two together. Within that, um, Ezra Klein's blog is part of the New York Times. And he covers a very wide range of topics, of course, but he's done a number of really good interviews with leaders in the AI field. So I'd recommend reading the Times and clicking on the Ezra uh, Klein podcast. Uh, then, I guess, given your interest, I'll, I'll go with two others. One is looking to the future. There's a book out fairly recently called Imaginable, How to See the Future Coming and Feel Ready for It by Jane McGonagill which I think opens very interesting things about preparing for the future. And then since you, like me, seem to like to know where this all comes from and who, who's doing this, there's a good book called Architects of Intelligence by Martin Ford, where he interviews a lot of the real AI leaders and 20 plus of them about you know, their backgrounds, kind of the questions you've asked me, what, what got them interested and then what did they really develop and what are their hopes and fears about it? It's now an ancient book. It was published in 2018. <laughs> and I've been using it on Audible to listen to it while you exercise. But I think there's a, if you really like to kind of get the histor historical picture or know that there were real people developing these things and struggling with the issues we're all struggling with, but had tremendous insights into what the possibilities were. I think Martin Ford's Architects of Intelligence is worth doing. So I cheated and probably kind of gave you four and a half, but I'll stop there since you asked for three. No, I love it. And I did not have imaginable or architects of intelligence on my radar at all. So I very much appreciate that. Great. And again, we're out of time. And and now I, but I have to admit my own naivete. When you mentioned the equity issue, I have only thought about through this the lens of finally we can have equity right finally we can all have didn't occur to me that we would uh just perpetuate structure i don't know why this didn't occur to me but perpetuate structures of independent schools and other schools of flexibility and da, 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 are going to do one thing and we're just going to you know uh, have poor kids have more monitoring of skills that are irrelevant most likely and not helpful well and i don't have time for my full rant but yes we we need and also you know, in the high poverty schools, we have much less stability of the teaching population. So if you talk about preparing teachers, well, those teachers are coming through those schools and not staying. And we may have uncertified teachers in those schools who aren't prepared to do all these things. So it goes across every issue of education. Um, and I think I would love to hear more conversations about Let's start with the big problems. Let's start with, we know we have issues of equity. We know we have issues of the teacher workforce. Uh, the list can go on and on of uh, how does AI help us address those really big educational challenges, not just what's the cool new tool and what do we do with it in the classroom? Right, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So so wonderful, so helpful. Um, thank you, Glenn. This was... I, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for invite, inviting me. And I really enjoyed the conversation. And I got six other things I'd like to ask you about, but hopefully we can do that at another time or offline. We will do part two for sure. Um, and there, a, a question in the chat about um, everything that you recommended in reference, we'll try to capture and we'll include when we post this. And then what we will also do at some point, 
Um, we have a few more uh, the schedule of the next several weeks, and then we'll probably pause for a moment, and I'll we'll compile everybody's recommendations into one giant, uh, and certainly yeah. give it obviously give credit to everyone that made the recommendations. But that um, we have one resource for everybody because I learned so much when we do this. So I look forward to to seeing that collection. Thank you. Um, so glad again, thank you so much. This was wonderful, um, and and truly both offline online. I would love to continue the conversation, and certainly. Uh, Yes, anything I can do, would love to do. Okay, well, definitely stay in touch. Thank you so much. And thanks to all who are listening or will be listening in. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye.